Hi everyone, I'm Julia Moskin, a writer for the New York Times Dining Section, and thank you for tuning into Recipe Lab, where we bring home cookbooks and cookbook authors together to talk about their recipes, cooking in general. And today, we're very excited to be joined by Mario Patali, down there in the middle, and his sons Benno and Leo, who have just published their first cookbook, the Patali Brothers Cookbook, I think much to their surprise, a book that they wrote for their father for his birthday and which ended up being published and now they're here to talk about it. We're just going to talk generally about cooking with kids. I mean obviously Vitaly children are going to have a little bit of an edge over regular kids like mine and like the other people who are in the hangout. So these are four home cooks and readers of the Times who have all tried their hand at making the pizza dough. So we're going to talk specifically about pizza and we're going to choose at least one question from the viewing audience so if you are interested and if you have some questions Please post it on Twitter using hashtag Recipe Lab. Thanks so much for being here, all of you. And Dara, why don't we start with you? Hi, everyone. I am a mom of two young boys from Nyack, New York. Uh, my boys are another Leo, five-year-old, and a three-year-old who love to cook in the kitchen. And I'm just a regular home chef with them, and they help me when they can. And Kim? Hi, my name is Kim Soltero, and uh, I have three boys, Will, who's here with me today, uh, Michael, and also Sam, and I recently uh, decided to shift careers, and I'm now attending culinary school at Johnson & Wales. And Will, how old are you? I'm 15 right now. And how long have you been cooking? I've been cooking ever since she could get me into the kitchen and realize <laughs> that I was some worth to her in there. <laughs> So let's say 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. And Charlotte. Hi, um, I'm Charlotte Pichet, and I'm, a f I'm 14 and a high school freshman living in Manchester, Mass. And I love cooking and baking. And I'm also a pescatarian, so this recipe was really perfect for me. Right, right. Um, so thanks, all. So Vitali family, I know it's hard to answer questions collectively, but um, maybe one of you could just introduce this recipe and what inspired it. We have a, out here, we're in Michigan right now, we have a pizza oven, so we love to make pizza out here. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of experiment with different doughs and everything, and we found a dough that we really liked, and we created, we just started making a lot of pizza out here, it's great. And is it related to the dough that is used at Otto, which of course is many New yes. Yorkers' favorite pizza place? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's the same pretty much. And Mario or Benno, what's the distinction of this particular dough maybe compared to other pizza doughs? Uh, it's got a little bit more less leavening because we traditionally cook this dough on a griddle as opposed to an oven. And uh, the toppings are put on after you've already marked the pizza the first time by putting it either on a cast iron skillet, on a griddle, or on a pan. Then you take it off and you finish it under the broiler. So it's a little bit different than the traditional pizza. Right, and that's so interesting, and I think that's what made it really helpful for a lot of the families who made it, which is this idea that you could kind of par cook it and then finish it off with different toppings. And it made me think, like, why doesn't everyone make pizza this way? Is it a regional specialty, or is it just something you guys figured out? Well, it came out of necessity at Oto. We couldn't put a wood-burning pizza oven in there, and I was fascinated and in love with the location of 15th Avenue. So we modified pizza to make it fit there, and it's worked for a lot of people at home. It's really cool. So, Charlotte, I know that you actually tested this recipe out not once but twice. Can you tell us uh, why and what your results were? Um, so once I tried it out with um, all-purpose baking flour and because I couldn't find double zero flour and I tried it on um, just a pan and then the second time I try I was able to find the double zero flour and I actually cooked it on the grill which worked out really really well and it had a nice like extra little char taste to it and I also put on veggies that I had um, cooked on the grill as well like eggplant, um, zucchini, some mushrooms and things like that. So Right, what's great is that it's so flexible of course. Mm -hmm. So. Vitaly Clan, what do you say about the zero zero flour? We got a lot of questions from readers, like, is this really necessary? I think Charlotte felt that the dough was different, that it was lighter and more delicate, and of course that's something that you want, although you also want it to be chewy. What is double O flour? Double zero flour is like a, a finer grain of flour. Finer and grind. Finer grind, and um, it allows the dough to be 
more tender and not as tighter. That's good. I could not have answered it better myself. Um, and then there's another kind of flour in the recipe, which was semolina flour. So what about that? Like, And are all of these things necessary, or is it really more flexible than it seems? Um, semolina is used to make sure that the dough does not stick. And um, you could use flour, but that would allow it. It would seep into the dough and flavor it differently. So semolina, semolina is very easy to brush off making it so it doesn't really affect the flavor. And so I know some of our readers use cornmeal. Do you think that that would be okay, or does that add some sort of weird flavor that you don't want in pizza? No, that's the same. It's very similar, so it works as well. Cool. Okay. Um, so let's talk about more kind of kid cooking in general. Um, not only, and that of course embraces what kids are going to eat, what kids are going to cook, food safety in the kitchen. There was a really interesting article this week on U in USA Today just suggesting that we abolish the whole idea of kid food altogether and that really nothing would be lost from the American diet except like goldfish and squeezable yogurt and that would mm -hmm. probably be a good thing. So Dara, I know that this is something that you have kind of strong feelings about so tell us about like what you try to feed your kids and of course there's what you feed your kids, and then there's kind of what is out there in the world that feeds your kids. So let's yeah. talk about that a little. There's definitely a, a combination. My kids are regular kids who love mac and cheese and chicken nuggets, but I try to serve them what we're eating or when we go out to try different cuisines. My husband and I have both traveled a lot in different countries, and so we like to go to different restaurants. And right now, my kids, their favorite foods are in Asia. My, my older son's favorite food is a shumai. And the three-year-old, believe it or not, his favorite is salmon sashimi, like by the fistful. And um, it's kind of unusual for kids, but I think it's just that's what we offer them. And so if there's not a lot of cho choices at the table, then that's what they, they eat and they taste. Um, and we also do the one taste rule. If um, we serve them something and they say, no, we're not going to eat it, that's fine, but they just have to have one, one taste of it. And that usually gets them over the hump. That's my rule as well. You don't have to eat it, but you do have to taste it. Yeah. Um, so Mario, Ben Leo, how did you guys get started? You know, obviously I think all parents want to raise somewhat omnivorous and adventurous eaters. How did you guys experience that from when you're old enough to remember? Um, ever since I remember, my dad has always been putting us in the kitchen, helping him work with making us meals and everything. And when we go out, he never really gave us the kid menu because a lot of kids become picky eaters because their parents kind of don't force them to try exotic foods and everything but my dad pretty much made us try everything and brought us up on a diet that's not like chicken nuggets and stuff like that. I think one of the big things that parents need to know is, is if, if you bring the children into the kitchen with you and work with anything by the time you're done with it, they've invested enough of their own emotional energy into it that they simply have to try it to do their own thing right. So as long as you're always cooking stuff and as long as you don't pre present it as the sacred or the dangerous or the most significant, kids are not that impressed by it. And as long as it tastes good and they see where it comes from, they understand they can get along with it. And what about your boys, Kim? I mean, you have the experience of three. That's a long progression. You can perform all sorts of behavioral experiments. Yeah, and, you know, actually with Will, we um, made a few mistakes, and we did, for the first few years, feed him totally separate meals because we wanted to have dinner to ourselves after he went to bed. And uh, when his brother, Michael, was born, we said, you know what, this is going to quickly become crazy um, and we need to just all start eating together and once we started eating together he started eating better and better and then we moved to Italy where there is no such thing as a children's menu um, and we started traveling all around Europe and you know if we were in Hungary and we were at a restaurant where there was going to be goulash for dinner he was eating goulash um, and by the time we came back from Italy, he was really omnivorous, which was fantastic. I think that made just a huge difference. But not, not having the option to make the safe choice and just stick with the chicken fingers over and over and over and over again, um, I think is really important. And Charlotte, I know you also had access to what maybe some American kids would consider exotic foods from an early age. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, my dad's um, from France, so I um, have a lot of French food, 
and um, my mom cooks a lot of food that she's learned from my dad's side of the family, but also um, like other exotic recipes too. Like we eat a lot of Indian food and Asian food, but um, yeah, France has really um, a lot of like. I, I see a lot of it in my cooking. I do a lot of baking, so I cook a lot of like crepes and clafouti and tartatan things like that. So, I that has definitely influenced my cooking. But your dad doesn't cook, right? Um, he cooks a little bit, but um, my mom's the biggest cooker in my family. So, right. So. Um... Mario and Benno and Leo, I know that, like, I think also for not for many American kids, vegetables are like a frontier. Like, they'll eat lamb stew or lamb chops and steak and get into, you know, maybe even salmon and sushi, but a lot of American kids really won't or don't eat vegetables. So, Mario, how did, how did you guys accomplish that? And Benno, like, what was your, what's your memory of growing up with the vegetable situation? Well, my dad would always just make vegetables taste good. Like he'd, and he'd how did make you do that olive oil, <laughs> olive oil, garlic, <laughs> salt, and lemon. Everything tastes good with olive oil, it's garlic, so salt, true. and lemon. And I mean, we started slow. We'd always start by just eating the heads of broccoli. We'd never eat the stalks, and that went on for a couple of years. But then, I mean, we kind of kind of just grew into it and began eating all vegetables slowly, but. One of the tricky ways to get everyone to eat any vegetable, even the challenging ones, is to toss them with a little perfectly cooked al dente spaghetti and olive oil. So then it becomes a dish that's kind of your main course, but it has vegetables in it that everyone recognizes. And then the way we do it is we serve it as a smaller portion, as a first course, so it's kind of like an easy guarantee on the way in. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are a few vegetables that are not improved by a little Parmesan cheese as well. So, yeah. can put that in. But it's interesting because I think a lot of American wow. parents think that when you have to make very plain vegetables for children, like wow. you see them being served like steamed broccoli and it's crispy and it's very, very plain. But I know, Mario, from eating in your restaurants, you really tend to stew them and cook them and braise them and get them really soft and flavorful. Do you think that's a way that's a good entry point for kids? Well, I think kids respond in, in a good way to the bright colors that are often by barely cooked vegetables. Mm -hmm. But if you cook them to a muted palate, I think that they taste better. I think they're more interesting. And they're although they taste more of themselves, they also taste like there's a little bit less intensity to it. They're, they're softer in that way, both in flavor and in texture. Right. Which is how and Italians eat all their vegetables. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they develop that sweetness, which, of course, right. kids find pretty irresistible. Speaking of which, Charlotte, you um, are not only a cook, but you are also starting a baking business. How did yeah. that come about? Um, this summer, well, I really, really like baking right now. I used to be into cooking a lot, so I'm going to be catering for, like, private parties and baking things. I have a couple of specialties, but also if anyone wants to order anything, I do that for them. And then I'm also going to be making, hopefully, crepes, um, just at a crepe stand, which is something a little bit different for um, people like going to the beach or going to the yacht club or things like that. So, really do you excited. have one of those big crepe makers? Yep, I ordered one. Um, you can get them on Amazon. They're like the in <laughs> industrial ones, and it's enormous, and I'm really excited. So, wow. Well, you are like the culinary parents' dream, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> now, didn't you also say that you had some kind of special tool that you used to make the Vitali Brothers pizza? Oh, yeah. Um, I actually, I had a question about that. Um, I wasn't sure if, um, I know for one recipe, um, you, um, Mario, you recommended using a piastra, like stone on the grill, and I was wondering if that would do well with the pizza or if that's more, I, I saw it um, on a muscle recipe, but I don't know if I was question about that. Um, a piastra would be good, as would a really hot car in a very hot day. Anything that holds heat is an excellent source. And being afraid to, you could even turn over your cast iron skillet if you didn't think it was big enough and cook it from the bottom up. As long as you can provide the heat and have the uh, patience not to move it too quickly, then it will set on both sides and you'll be in great shape. 
So a piastra would work, but a piastra is just another way that the Italians might use to make it easier to work on their grill. So speaking of heat and um, other dangers of the kitchen, Leo, Benno, do you remember your parents taking any particular precautions to keep you safe in the kitchen? I mean, my child, I did, he has like this special knife um, that Guy Fieri gave him actually, and he was so excited about it that he cut off the tip of his fingertip, and, and I got into a lot of big trouble about that. So did, did you guys just kind of learn your way starting with measuring spoons like a lot of kids, or did your dad just like throw you into the deep end of the pool? There were definitely some restrictions. At first we couldn't use knives without him like holding the knife with us. And then we couldn't use the stove top or the oven without them there home. And that was basically the only rules we had. And then now we don't really have any Now rules. there's no rules at all. <laughs> <laughs> but Dara, I know that you worry about that quite a bit. Yeah, mine are little and they're really eager in the kitchen, like over eager. So they want to jump right in. And I worry about the stove. And, and I actually made the pizza on the grill outside because I couldn't find my grill pan. And we, my kids actually don't see the grill open a lot because we use it at night when they're asleep, usually. And so they were so excited to see the flame and it hot that they just ran right up to it. So I think it was just me being really vigilant. But if you had any other suggestions about what you said to your sons to keep them safe in the kitchen. Well, if they thought that there was a chance that they could hurt themselves or something looked like they didn't really understand it, then they shouldn't touch it until they came and got me. And that could go with, a, if, you have a, if you have a commercial style oven in your house, often the front of it isn't very insulated and you could just rub up against it and burn yourself. So I told the kids that, that anything that is shiny could probably hurt them. So if they have a question, check with me. And that's knives and that's uh, any kind of metal surface. When they walk in the kitchens and the restaurants, they know to stay on the other side than the shiny stuff or on the hot line. What do you do for food safety in terms of like eggs and raw meat, things like that? Because my kids want to, their hands want to be in that as well. And as soon as they're done, they're ready to run off and play with their toys. And I'm always like, wait, stop. Every time you touch any single thing and then move to another thing, you always have to wash your hands. And if they don't, if they can't reach that, then you should make them a little basin that's on their mm -hmm. own little workstation and let them know that that's what they have to do. Good idea. Yeah, having a separate workstation is really great. Um, and also, I mean, of course, that's what chefs do, you know, wash their hands from step to step. So I can see why that would be natural for Mario. What I did when my kids started getting old enough to come in the kitchen, and I do have a sort of restaurant-style stove, and the front of it gets really hot, every apartment that we've lived in, I've, in, in the kitchen there is what we call a hot spot. And so they know that if I say, go to the hot spot, that means like something is hot is about to happen. Like I'm about to open the oven or there's some flame coming and there's a place for them to stand that's far away where they, but where they can still oh. watch. And so it's a so safe spot. It's like a safe spot, but you know, hot spot rhyme. So we use that and it's just right. like hot spot, hot spot. And it really, that really works well for us. So you can try that. Your kids are of an age where they could understand that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Good. Well, um, and actually, without even cooking, of course, um, and one of the reasons that we chose this recipe is that there was so much that little kids could do or big kids could do before you even get to the point of cooking, measuring, mixing, kneading, all of that. So how did that go for you guys? I find it really hard. Um, and one of the things I think that's important to let go of when you are teaching kids to cook is that you have to not be too worried about mess, um, which is hard with flour. It goes everywhere. You can get really stressed out. Um, but I think you have to be very zen and understand that your kitchen is going to be a mess. Um, that was one issue that came up with me and my kids when we made the recipe. Um, Kim and Will, what about you guys? Um, I don't think we had too much trouble. We Everyone in my house is used to the kitchen being a disaster after I'm done with it, so, you know, that's easy breezy. Um, but I think the thing that we got a little hung up on was that when we started shaping the pizzas, Will really wanted a circular pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and I really just wanted a pizza that would go on the griddle. What do you think, Will? I don't know. I thought we were, we were spending some good time trying to get everything the way that we wanted it to be. Yeah. And so I thought once we got to that point, I wanted to make a product that I would be happy with. But um, it turned out when we ate them, they all tasted fine. They all tasted the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mario, do you think that, you know, perfectionism is something that you really have to let go of in the kitchen with kids? Or do you feel like if they're going to learn to do it, they should learn to do it right, just like the way you would teach a sous chef? 
Well, I, I appreciate actually that the younger person of the couple there was the one that was more <laughs> obsessed with the proper shape. And, and, and what that tells you is that there are a thousand ways to make a pizza and that everyone should make the pizza exactly as they see that they want it to be done, provided that you go along with the recipe for the dough. After you've got there, it's a framework from which you can make a thousand paintings. And, and I don't think, do you guys think that I ever forced you to make a particular shape of pizza? Or that I even cared? I don't think I even cared. So as long as we were together and working on it, each person can express their own importance and their own significance to what they think is important. Um, we do have a question from a reader, uh, Lori in Michigan, maybe not far away from you, um, is specifically interested in what kinds of recipes or even what particular recipes you think are good starters when cooking with kids. I think breakfast is definitely the easiest. Usually the whole family is around unless uh, you, you're an early riser or have a job that makes you go home early, I mean leave home early. But um, a lot of the easiest stuff happens for breakfast. Like you can just start by making scrambled eggs. Pancakes aren't hard. And that was definitely how we started in the kitchen. And I think it's a very easy introduction. That's how all three of my kids have started in the kitchen too, pancakes. I love pancakes. <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> well, we can't have pancakes every day. What else besides pancakes? I think my kids like to have quesadillas pretty often. That's a helpful quesadillas. one. Quesadillas. That's a big one. Basically, that's having pizza for breakfast, of course. <laughs> yep. S scrambled eggs was definitely, that was the first one that I learned, at least. And it's really simple, and it tastes really good. And it's yeah. really easy to do really, really well if you pay attention. As long as you keep stirring them, they get nice and creamy curd. Okay, that was my next question because, yes, they are easy to cook very well, but they're also easy to cook very, very badly. So I wanted to make sure that you have the constant stirring scrambled eggs that we all appreciate so much. So, Well, as opposed to using a spatula, we like to use a whisk so that you can constantly wow. break the curd and keep them nice and smooth and, and take them off the heat every now and then and put them back on the heat. It's really going to be almost more like a custard than it is like a a bunch of balls of chunks of stuff that have mm -hmm. So what, Leo, like when you were little, had it like, do you feel like you learned how it was supposed to look and how it was, like, is that part of it? Because I think yeah. you, know, you want them to stay shiny. And, and But some people think those are things that only chefs can do, you know, is really track the progress of a, of a scrambling egg. Do you feel like since you started young, you were able to learn that? Yeah, definitely. Also, the a lot of things that my dad made, definitely the looks of that made me a better chef and made me know what to do other than what I other thought. And okay, so that's breakfast. Any thoughts about a dinner recipe, a good place to start? I think I probably started with like a big ziti or something, you know, that had different components or lasagna because it's fun to kind of put things together and then pasta. come up with something. What do you think, Benno? Um, I, yeah, pasta is always the easiest. You can really add that and make it your own in any way you can add. I think they were surprised how easy it was to make the fresh noodles when they really made them the very first time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they yeah. had a rather expert teacher. <laughs> yeah, something I've noticed about a lot of these things, like the pasta and the breakfast foods, a lot of the things that are good to make with kids are the things that you can do a lot of different stuff with. So it's exactly. not something that really has to follow a really strict code or recipe. It's something that the kids can kind of take and do whatever they want with it to make it something they're proud of and something that they really want to eat. And how much, I mean, I know obviously we all want to feed our kids healthy food. To what extent do we feel like that should be a concern? And I'm kind of putting that out to the group, Dara. I know you wanted specifically to know if you could substitute maybe a more whole grain flour for part of the flour in the pizza, that kind of thing. Mario, I'm sure you get questions like that all the time. What do you guys think? Well, I think as long as you pay attention that there's vegetables in all of your meals, you're already on the right path. Certainly, you can uh, do 50-50 whole wheat flour without changing the recipe and its elasticity too much. And then the rest of it's kind of about portion control and variation, I think. And I think a lot of kids already like that. They like different colors, and different textures than the same thing every day. One thing that really helped us, too, was that we, um, at one point, when we lived in California, uh, joined a CSA for a few years, and we really had gotten into a fruit and vegetable rut at our house, so people were a little bit bored with the things that we were eating. When we joined the CSA, suddenly we were getting things that we had never eaten before. And, you know, once it comes into the house, you're going to do something with it. 
Um, and so it really helped us kind of try new things and find new favorites and, you know, just kind of expand our horizons a little bit. All right, and I have one last question for all the kids. When you have cooked with your families, do you also have to clean up or do you get excused from that part? Charlotte, what about you? I definitely have to clean up, but my mom helps me a lot too. And um, I don't really get any help from my brother or sometimes my dad helps me too, but it's mostly like you make the mess, you clean it up. But I think when I was younger, I definitely didn't have to clean up as much, but my mom still tried to make it fun, so it would be something I had to do. So that's that was my experience. And Will, what about you? I think the bigger of a role that I play in the meal, the less I actually have to clean up. That's what kind of pushes me towards helping the cook in the kitchen a lot more. If I don't do as much, she'll give me more of a workload afterwards. So I will be stuck with the most of the dishes or sweeping the floors or cleaning the countertops. But it's something that our whole family kind of works together on. Good. And Benno and Leo, what about the cleanup? Um, we live by the rule, clean as you go. So basically by the end, there's very little to clean. But at that point, um, usually <laughs> the person that has done the most cook, uh, cooking is exempt from cleaning the little mess that is left. Yeah. Right. It's convenient cook, in a family where clean. you have... Wait, I'm sorry, what was that, Mario? If you cook, you don't have to clean. Right, that's the rule oh, I grew yeah. up with. It was very convenient when you have two parents and two kids. One helps with cleanup, one helps with cooking. That's right. the rule. It never changes. So, guys, I'm sorry. I'm getting the signal that we are going to wrap up this edition of Recipe Lab. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here, especially Mario Benolio all the way from right. Michigan. Thank you for coming. Dara, Kim, Will, Charlotte. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you so Thank much. You. Bye. Thank you.